book of Daniel, we looked at, at, at one of the, you know, the, the worst leaders that came out of that, of course, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, go to the next slide. That was after Alexander's kingdom was divided up into four. And, of course, you remember all the visions and everything that we looked at all through these months in, in the book of Daniel. And these four divisions, and, of course, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes came out of the Seleucid kingdom. The, the green on the, on the screen there. Next slide, Daniel. And then you move into, of course, what? Roman. The Roman Empire and its great expanse. And, of course, being the empire in which uh, Jesus ended up uh, being born into and crucified and so forth. Next slide, Dan. And just, this was just to give you an idea on the world map. You see, you see where Iran is. That, that, that was basically where Persia was. And you can see Iraq then to the left of Iran and Syria. And Israel is a tiny little, tiny little strip over there beside Jordan that you can barely see uh, north, north and west of Saudi Arabia. That, that's, where, that's the world today. That's where these locations uh, were that we looked at. Next slide. So Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the statue, we went over, went over that very much. I, have to just, I just wanted to give you a quick flash of all this stuff. Next slide. Remember, remember what that's called? Say, say it again. Yeah, it's the Washington Monument. And, and that type of a, that's a modern day example of what type of a structure? Say it again. An obelisk. Now remember that? that? That's probably what the statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected. Remember the statue of gold and so forth? Uh, that some felt that it was a statue of himself, but because of the, the dimensions of an obelisk, if, if you were here whenever I preached through that, um, the, the dimensions don't suit. For, it would be an odd-looking figure of a person, wouldn't it? With, with the, the dimensions of, of an obelisk. So next, next slide. This, this was another picture, uh, thanks to Di Diane, um, sent this to me. Um, another picture that shows the statue and also then the beasts of Daniel's dream, as well as the, the ram and the goat of, of Daniel's second dream there, and how a lot of this stuff ties in together. The next, next slide, we have to just go, I just wanted to give you a brief look at this. This is, of course, my eternal timeline, um, which I've also changed again slightly after I handed out all the copies of it. It's very, it's very slight. I added verse 13 to the reference for the resurrection of the Old Testament and tribulation saints, Daniel 12, 1 and 2, and also verse 13. I should have had on there, but next slide. And that's it. Okay. So I just wanted to give you that, just one quick look at that again. You know, that, that was a, all these months of teaching through the, the book of Daniel and all the different aspects and so forth. And now we're up to ta chapter 12 and we are going to finish today. And so turn your in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew. Oh, Matthew. I, I, was, I had Matthew in my book, in my Bible here. Daniel chapter 12. I've, yeah, I was going backwards from Matthew and got the, got the wrong one. So Matthew, I said it again. Daniel chapter 12. You don't want me to start in Matthew because that will take a while. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And I scared myself early on because it took me a long time in verse 1 as I was preparing. But let's, let's look at verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people... Whose people? Daniel's people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Now, I just want to say real quickly, uh, Dale or Steve or somebody, did, did you did you switch over to air? Okay, very good. Uh, hopefully, I see that the, these are still on. Hopefully, they don't start pushing heat while it's pushing. Um, they might need turned off the mini splits because they could still end up starting to push heat the way they work. So, verse 12 starts out, at that time. At that time, referring to, referring to what time that we looked at in the book of Daniel? Well, but, but in the book of Daniel, what verses at that time? What we just finished last week. 
the last, the last verses in chapter 11 that we looked at last week, that was, that was the time that this is, is saying at that time. It refers to the, the stuff we looked at at the end of uh, at the sermon last week at the end of chapter 11. Again, the revelation of the angel to Daniel simply continued from chapter 11 verse 45 to chapter 12 verse 1. It was a really bad place for the people to put a uh, put a chapter break in it that, that when they put those in there many years after the Bible was written, but, but they did. So at the time of the rise of the little horn, who we know best as Antichrist, and at the time of the events of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble, the nation of Israel, Daniel's people, it said, the angel said, will be delivered from a time of horrific trouble. The archangel Michael, Israel's angelic defender whom we first read about back in chapter 10, will participate in this deliverance of the nation of Israel when this time happens, when this time comes, which will come, it's again, continuing along with what we looked at last year, studying about the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, and the events that will be happening when he rises to power and so forth. In that time, Israel will have the worst trouble they've ever had had, but they will be delivered from it. Although Michael, uh, the angel, was not always named, we can also see uh, angelic involvement on Israel's behalf, on the nation of Israel's behalf in Scripture. You can look at Joshua chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 37, all mention, mention angelic involvement in uh, coming to the aid of Israel. But Michael is clearly named in Revelation 12. Verses 7 through 9, where we read this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled, hurled to the earth and his angels with him, end quote. I believe that battle that I just read from Revelation chapter 12, I believe that battle between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation period. John explained what he saw in past tense because he had already seen the vision and then he was writing and describing what he saw. And so don't get mixed up about the past tense nature of that. This stuff still hasn't happened. Satan still has an audience with God. But we have a defender. He accuses us, the book of Revelation says. But we have a defender for us in that heavenly realm when Satan accuses us before the Father. Who defends us? The Lord Jesus Christ. A great defense attorney. Satan and his fellow demons will be thrown out of the heavenly realm at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And in an evil rage, Satan will drive and empower who? The Antichrist. He will drive him to exterminate the Jews as a people. Satan will still be a spirit being. And some believe he will actually indwell the Antichrist, much in the same kind of a way as the Holy Spirit indwells, lives inside of those who come to saving faith in Jesus. Many believe that when Satan is hurled out of the heavenly realm and at the midpoint of the tribulation period, that he will actually indwell, live inside of the Antichrist. It will be a time of great and unprecedented trouble and distress for the entire world. But especially and specifically for whom? For Israel. The Jewish people. I will tell you that the... Well, first of all, what's the Septuagint? The first Bible. No. That's the Pentateuch. Yeah, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Is the Septuagint. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Why do I bring that up? Because in, in the Septuagint for chapter 12, verse 1 in Daniel, where it's, it's translated in English distress, the Septuagint uses the Greek word flip, flipless. It's hard to say. Flipsis. That Greek word, it's the same Greek word that Jesus uses then in, in Matthew 
chapter 24, when, and it's translated there, distress as well. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus said, Then, talking about this, Jesus still talking about this future time, then there will be great distress, flipsis, great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. And so, the word, again, the Hebrew word is translated distress, and the Greek word used, that, that is used in the, in the New Testament that's translated distress, same word, Jesus is talking about the same distress, the same trouble, the same, it can also be translated tribulation. Great distress can, is translated as great tribulation in Revelation 7.14. And now you know the rest of the story about why we call it the tribulation period. It's because especially of Revelation 7.14 and the fact that even Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24 could actually be translated great tribulation as well. Um, usually it's translated great distress. And notice how Jesus echoed what Daniel said here in, in Daniel uh, chapter 12, verse 1. What I quoted Jesus is talking about, Jesus was echoing the prophet Daniel. Still, some 200 years later, Jesus is still talking about the future, future tense, the future events coming, this terrible time where, and especially where the, the Jews will see something that, the, that has never been seen before and will never be seen again. Jesus is saying it's still future, future tense, even when Jesus was on the earth. It could not have been Antiochus Epiphanes. For though there are many who say that Jesus you know, was just talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. It, it couldn't have been. He was still talking about something that hadn't happened yet. Jesus was still predicting the same future distress that the angel told Daniel about. And surely nobody can reasonably claim that the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in AD 70 was an event that was unequaled from the beginning of the world and never to be equaled again. Yeah, it was a big deal for the people in Jerusalem, but to say that it was something that was never anything of that magnitude happened before would never happen again. Obviously, that destruction of one town in one little part of the world did not meet that description. We should also understand that the deliverance of, of Daniel's people Israel that is mentioned here in verse 1 is not primarily about the physical deliverance of individuals. In fact, Zechariah, Zechariah 13 and verse 8 says that two-thirds of the Jewish people will die. Two-thirds of them will die. They will not be delivered. It's not about individuals' deliverance. The deliverance spoken of in Daniel 12.1 refers to the preservation of what? The nation. The nation of Israel as a whole, and her deliverance from Gentile persecution, which we have been looking at, that was predicted all through the book of Daniel. Again, how can you study this stuff? What we've looked at since January, the beginning of January, and about the context of Israel and Gentile world power suppression and oppression of Israel, it's, all, it's about Israel in this future time that hasn't happened yet. It's still about Israel. It will be, again, Daniel 70th 7, as we've seen so many times. When we get to that time, Jesus Messiah will bring an end to that time of the Gentiles. Jesus spoke about it in Luke 21, verse 24. You can also see Romans 11, verse 25, that again talks about that, that the times of the Gentiles. Also at this time of the promised deliverance of the nation Israel, all Jews, and listen to this part, at this time when, when Israel will be delivered, this promised deliverance of the nation, also all Jews going all the way back to Abraham, who had the real faith that, that God required, the Jews whose names were written in God's record book of His true people, all those Jews going clear back to Abraham will enter into the millennial kingdom of Jesus on the earth. Now, most of those Jews would have been, will be long dead by that time. How will they enter into this earthly kingdom? Well, let's read the next two verses and we'll find out. 
Verses 2 and 3. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I've discussed many times, uh, a lot of times in the Bible when it talks about somebody sleeping, it's referring to what? Death. Death. Um, and so here when it says um, many sleep in the dust of the earth, it simply refers to those who have, have died and were buried. And it says their spirits, well, you know, we understand that their spirits continue to live on either one of two places, either the glorious dwelling place of the spirits of the saved or in the tormenting prison cell of the spirits of the unsaved. I believe the angel was primarily telling Daniel here that after the time of great trouble for Israel, that all the dead Jews since the first Jew Abraham will be raised to life at this time, resurrected. Their spirits rejoined to an immortal body. Every one of them. But there's two different classes of them. The Jews who had the faith that God will, required will be resurrected immediately after the tribulation period to glorify the immortal bodies and they will enter what? The millennial kingdom of Jesus here on the earth. Their Messiah. And they will reign with Him. For a thousand years, it says in Revelation 20. And so the unbelieving Jews, though, of all the ages, they won't be resurrected until after the Millennial Kingdom. And then when they are resurrected to immortal bodies, they will face the judgment and the condemnation of what is called in Revelation 20 what? The Great White Throne. And the result of that will be that they will be cast forever where? Into the lake of fire. The message that God would remain faithful to His covenant with Israel and fulfill it someday is being brought across here at the close of Daniel. It was to be an encouragement to faithful Jews and to inspire them to lead others to righteousness. Now without, without question, every human being will be resurrected someday. Every human being will be resurrected to an immortal body someday. But it will be one of two kinds of resurrections. But the same truths apply to all people. But the primary context here is the nation of Israel. Because that's been the context all the way through the book of Daniel. And this will be the end result of the last domination of a Gentile king over the nation of Israel. And the person that will bring that to a close will be none other than who? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ when He returns to the earth to establish His millennial kingdom. And believing Jews going all the way back to Abraham will be resurrected and will be in that kingdom reigning with Jesus just like who else will be? Us. All of us today who have placed true saving, true saving faith in Jesus, we will also have already been resurrected when? At the rapture, at the beginning of the tribulation period, we will already have been resurrected and we will return with Jesus after the seven years of the tribulation and also reign with Him in that millennial kingdom. That's how all this stuff fits together, but don't miss the focus on Israel. The angel was talking to Daniel about who? His people. His people. Israel. And once again, so many today somehow mysteriously find a way to make that be the church. The church were not Daniel's people. The church wouldn't exist for, for another over 200 years. I will, I will acknowledge to you today that there are a number of varying interpretations of some aspects of these first three verses here in Daniel 12. Even among other folks like me who hold a premillennial theology. But I obviously stand by my views. I've ex explained in basics why I believe what I believe. I would be glad to explain them in, in more detail uh, if anybody would want that at any time. But I will also say that for the most part, these things are, some of these differences are not something that I'm going to be willing to die at the stake over.
It's not that big of a deal, but I believe what I believe, and I explain why I believe what I believe. And I can do that more with anybody that would like, like to have that at some point. Verse 4, look at verse 4 with me. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. So the angel told Daniel to, to close up and see, seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. The words of the scroll being what? The information he's getting right now. The stuff that, that and in fact, I think all of what Daniel had been, what had been revealed to Daniel by the, the angel and in the dreams and all that stuff, but especially including the stuff at the end here, Daniel was told to seal that up. Close and seal the words of that scroll until the time of the end. He was to write everything down. And he was protected and preserved that information that had been provided by God through the angel so that it could be sustained until when? What's it say in verse 4? Until when? The end. Until the time of the end. This revelation has, has had relevance to, to human beings ever since it was given. Absolutely. It still has relevance to, to, to us today. But the reality is that much of what is to be understood about this, especially this revelation about this final 70th 7 of Daniel, much of what is to be understood about that will have its primary importance in the days when it is happening during the time of the end, which will be the tribulation period, Daniel 70th 7. What I'm trying to get across to you is, it, yes, it has importance for us. But the biggest importance will be for those who read about it when this stuff is happening. Daniel couldn't understand a lot of it. We can, today we can understand more of it because we have more revelation available to us, but we still don't get it all, right? But when the tribulation is underway, people will be running around trying to find answers to what's going on. And you know where many of them will end up? In the Bible. And they will get it. They will understand. In the prophetic passages of Daniel and the other prophetic passages in the Bible, they will see what is unfolding before their eyes and they will understand what it's all about. Understanding of this prophecy will grow when that knowledge will be most needed. And I think that those who benefit the most in that time will be Daniel's people, Israel. Jews who come to accept Jesus as their Savior and as the promised Messiah during that time of hell on earth. Especially for Jewish people, especially for the nation of Israel. Verses 5 and 6. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. And one of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? So remember that Daniel was still describing the vision given to him on the banks of the Tigris River. The angel started to explain this clear back in chapter 10. Angels are still revealing truths of God to him, to Daniel, at this point. The man clothed in linen here that we read about in these verses, as I discussed in chapter 10, is thought by some to have been a pre-incarnate appearance of, of God the Son. But as I said back then, I and others believe he was just an angel. The two described in these verses as being on opposite banks of the river were undoubtedly angels as well. And one of those two angels on opposite banks of the river asked the man in linen angel, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Now, something you've got to be careful about. The astonishing things refers to the events described earlier about the final domination of Israel by the little horn, by Antichrist, during this never-seen-before time of distress, the tribulation period. The how long, therefore, does not refer to how long until these things would start happening, but rather to how long the events would last after they start happening. 
And that becomes clear when we get moved to the next verse and look at it. The thing is, we already we are already told about starting points for this, but th this time that's being referred to here as far as when all these climactic events, w w when will it come to an end, that's what's in, that's what's in view. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for what? A time, a times, and a half time. When the power of the holy people has, finally, has been finally broken, then all these things will be completed. As the man in, linen, the man in linen angel began to answer, he swore by him who lives forever. It's a clear reference to who? God. To God. And only God has always lived forever. He has lived forever past and forever future. All human beings will live forever future, but it had a finite beginning, right? Same thing with the angels. So it's a clear reference to, to God and that this duration of these terrible days, the angel said, would be the same expression of time that we've seen before. The second half of the 70th seven. And again, if you haven't been tracking with me I, I, through this whole deal, I, I, I understand that some of this stuff you're going to really have a hard time understanding what I'm talking about. But you just have, you have to go back and look at the earlier sermons and we really talked about this 70th seven year period of time that is the the final prophetic time period that has remains yet to be fulfilled. This would be the second three and a half years of the tribulation. It's described in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 that we discussed previously. All of these events will end, all this, this, this climactic time of terror and horror and so forth will end when, according to this verse that we just read, after what? Uh, okay. Well, after that time is done, but it says after then what? After the power of the holy people is broken. And who are the holy people? Israel. Israel. During this time of trouble, the nation of Israel will be broken as never broken before. Until they finally accept Jesus as their Messiah. Zechariah chapters 12 and 13 tell more about, shed additional light on how God will break Israel through the refining fire of this time until they mourn over their nation's rejection and killing of their Messiah. And they finally turn to Him as a nation in faith. Look at verse 8. This is Daniel speaking. I heard, but what? I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this be? Now, I, I didn't even remember. to. I was going to put some in my notes about this. I've talked about this before. Did I talk about it in my sermons about the, the Lord. Lord with all capitals? Or did I, was that Wednesday night? Was that during a sermon? Yeah. Okay, so this is spelled, Lord is spelled how in your Bibles? Lowercase. All lowercase letters, right? All small case letters. That, that means, it's, that means it's, a, it's using the term that simply refers to, uh, it's a term of respect. Like we would say, sir. Unfortunately, I'm not sure, but I think the King James might have wrongly capitalized it. You know, I know that's blasphemy to say that King James has something wrong with it, but I think they may have it as capital. But it's if you again, I went over those Greek or those um, Hebrew words before um, Adonai and Adon, and Adon is the one that's translated with all small letters. If it was Adonai, it would be a capital L, um, Lord. So he wasn't talking to, to Daniel. wasn't asking God, he was speaking to the angel here. My Lord or Sir, what will be the outcome of all this? So Daniel heard what was being said, but he wasn't really getting it, right? There are many times now you got to admit, probably for many of you here today, there's many times when we hear the word of God and we don't get it, right? Uh, uh, you know, some of you are probably saying, yeah, like right now, but Daniel at that time, can you imagine at this point in Daniel's life, all this stuff we've looked at through 12 chapters of the book of Daniel, can you imagine being in his sandals and trying to grab, like, what the heck is all this now? I can't, you know, mind blown. We can't 
understand it sitting here with what we even know. You know, it kind of blows us away. Can you imagine being Daniel? These prophecies of future events, you know, were confusing Daniel. And remember, Daniel was a smart dude. Like, he was no dummy. He was a smart dude. He said, what will the outcome of all this be? The thing is, you know, Old Testament prophets often, probably a lot more than what we realize, Old Testament prophets didn't actually understand what the Holy Spirit gave them to write down. I want to quote something out of the New Testament about that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Listen, concerning this salvation, this is relative to the doctrine of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, which the prophets wouldn't have known anything about. Jesus hadn't come to the earth yet. God, the second person of the Trinity, hadn't taken on a human form, let alone been crucified on the cross and risen from the dead. But concerning this salvation that Peter would have been preaching and talking about, he said the prophets, meaning the Old Testament prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them, the Spirit of Christ being... The Holy Spirit, that the, the, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing to when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them, to these Old Testament prophets, Peter said, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Who was Peter talking to? People in the, the church age, after Jesus had died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead and went back to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to start the church. He's saying the prophets were actually writing for you when they wrote these, a lot of these things. When they spoke of these things that they have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things, Peter said. End quote. What, well, quickly, why did angels look into these things? Because they don't have a <clears throat> Because angels can't be saved from their disobedience of God. The angels that fell, that rebelled with, with Satan... They're, they're done forever. They were condemned as soon as they rebelled. Angels cannot be saved. Jesus did not die for angels, folks. Jesus died for human beings. The angels longed to look into this thought of salvation and how Jesus' death on the cross could like save some human beings. from the, They deserve punishment, just like Satan and his angels. The, these other, these holy angels, these elect angels, they knew, that, they knew what the other angels were condemned to. But now they, and they see that people sin, and so how do, they have, how do they have a chance? How can they be saved from the condemnation that they deserve in the lake of fire with the, with the demons that, that who were made to be angels of God but rebelled against Him? They, they didn't understand. They longed to look into this thing. Angels long to understand about how a sinner like me, through the death of Jesus Christ, could be allowed into heaven instead of getting the hell that I deserve. Isn't that cool? Jesus didn't die for angels. He died for people like you and me. For all who would come to Him in saving faith. Verses 9 and 10. He, this is the angel, replied to Daniel, Go on your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. The wicked always like to continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So again, we see the reference to the message being preserved. To the message that the angels had communicated. The message from God that the angels communicated to Daniel to write down and preserve and protect and secure for the future. We see this reference to that. And when, when the time comes for the people who will really need to understand these things then it will be there for them. This is another reference to that here in these verses. Daniel would have to rest in the assurance he couldn't understand, he didn't get it, there was a lot of it, he just couldn't get it all, I'm sure. He would just have to rest in the assurance of that promise. He was not going to understand everything. This stuff was going to one day make a lot of sense to people who were going through it. 
for him, he needed to just rest in that assurance from the angel and further assurances that the angel was going to give him here as we're approaching the end of the book. It's doubtful that Daniel could have understood everything that had been revealed to him in any way. It's doubtful that he could have put the concepts together of God Himself taking on a human body and coming to the earth and living a sinless life and dying to, to be a sacrifice, sacrificial substitute uh, for the atonement of sin. How could Daniel, even if he would have been told that, how could he have fathomed all that stuff? Heck, people today don't fathom it. I always refer to that lady that used to work for me. What, remember what she said? That's wild, man. <laughs> yep, Misty, it's wild. But it's the Word of God. This is, this is real. How do you think it had been for Daniel to try to... Even if he would have been told. He, he couldn't have grasped this stuff. Furthermore, when the time comes, many Jews will believe in their Messiah. When, when the time of the end comes... There will be many Jews who believe in their Messiah and understand these prophecies. No doubt because God will open their closed eyes, open their covered ears, but the wicked whom God allows to continue in their wickedness, who continue to have their eyes closed and their, and their ears plugged up, those that God allows to do that, they will not get it. They will not believe. They will not understand. Saving faith and belief always precede further understanding, and then understanding continues to grow after that. But those who try to understand without first having saving faith only get more confused and more confounded, and especially those who don't even want to hear it, right? You don't want to even hear the truth, you're not going to believe in it, unless God does something supernatural. We see this very often in the Bible when asked why He taught in parables. Jesus said this, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them, meaning the unbelievers. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance, Jesus said. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And I can't exposit these verses right now. Um, yes, our time draws nigh. So, but anyway, Jesus said... What, even what these unbelievers have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. And then Jesus quoted an Old Testament. He said, Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. He's speaking of the people of Israel. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Why? For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. They would not believe, and they could not believe. In my comments on verse 1, I mentioned that one-third of the people of Israel would be saved as the believing remnant, according to Zechariah 13.8. In, in Zechariah 13.9, God says this of that remnant of Israel that He will preserve. Remember, two-thirds will die. <coughs> two-thirds of the Jewish people will die during this time. But God will preserve that remnant of one-third. Here's what Zechariah said in verse 9 of chapter 13. This third, God says, I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord, all capital, all capital letters, Yahweh is our God. This passage in Zechariah 13, this verse 9 that I just quoted, that's parallel to here in verse in, in, um, in, in the book of Daniel. It's parallel to the many who will be purified and made spotless and refined that we just read in verse 10. This, this, this uh, passage in Zechariah 13.9 parallels verse 10 here in, in chapter 12. The many in Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 are the one-third who will be preserved and refined through fire in Zechariah 13.8 and 9. You got me? 
And both of them, both of them represent the same group of people as the symbolic woman in Revelation chapter 12 and, and verses 13 and following who will be taken care of, it says in Revelation 13, or yeah, Revelation chapter 12, will be taken care of for how long? No. Good try, though. Good guess. A time, a times, and a half time. That three and a half year period. That woman who is symbolized, Israel was symbolized as a woman there, and the dragon will be pursuing her and so forth, Satan. But God will preserve that third that Zechariah talks about, the many that the angel told Daniel about here in Revelation 12, chapter 12, that woman who will be preserved as she's being pursued by the dragon. That's referring to the same group. All three, Zechariah, Daniel, and the book of Revelation, all three talking about the same group of people this remnant of Israel that God said He would always preserve a remnant, they will all be preserved at the end of the tribulation period and will enter into the millennial kingdom. Ain't God's Word cool? Yeah. Huh? And the more you know of it, I, I understand a lot of you like you just, you don't have a, much of a perspective about this because you just, you haven't heard a lot of the facts even that I've talked about before in sermons, but it, it just, the more pieces of the puzzle, right? The more pieces of the puzzle that I talk about all the time, the more of the pieces of the puzzle you put together, you, you're a big puzzle girl, right? Yeah, you're the, you're the puzzle woman, right? You know that the more of those pieces you get in, you get in place, Stan, do you help with the puzzles? No, he no, you're not a puzzle guy. Okay. I'm not surprised, but anyway. But the more pieces of that puzzle you get together, the better you can see the picture and, and fit the other pieces in, right? Isn't that the way a puzzle works? I've not done too many of them, but I know enough to I know that much. That's again, you start plugging in these, especially passages from these books that like God, nobody understands and nobody wants to look at and stuff. The book of Zechariah, you know, yeah, that's on your daily reading list, right? The book of Zechariah, you know, Zechariah and Daniel and the book of Revelation. But here, all three of those references, all talking about, all three of those references talking about the same thing, the same group of people that God will preserve out of Israel. It's so cool when you start putting the pieces together. It does make sense then. A lot of times it doesn't make sense. For, for you who this isn't making any sense, you got to just trust me. It used to not make any sense to me too, but the, when you learn more, the more you learn, you get to the point where it does. And where you can plug these different pieces together and say, yeah, yeah, that's it. All, all three of these references talking about the same thing. That third will be preserved and Jesus will return, conquer His enemies, and He will reign over Israel as King of Kings with that third of the, of the Jews of that time entering into the tribulation, that third of them preserved and they will be the first citizens of the millennial kingdom of Jesus here on this earth. Verses 11 and 12. We've got to get, get done here. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, when's that time? Halfway through. Halfway through the tribulation period, three and a half years into it. From that time, when, when, that, when that stuff happens, halfway through the tribulation period, there will be 1,290 days. And then blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1,335 days. Oh, well, what... 1260 days are, are the three and a half years that will be left, so what's up? So we have two more mysterious prophecies of, at the end of the book of Daniel about specific numbers of days. We can be pretty certain that Daniel had no idea what the 1290 days meant or the 1335 days. Pretty well certain Daniel didn't know. You think I know? Yeah. Yeah. You would be wrong. <laughs> and you will be disappointed, Tina. Because I know Tina was waiting to hear me say what this was. But we can make some educated guesses, and I will do that. Uh, you know, based upon further revelation of God that we have in the completed Bible. But the reality is, we just still don't know for sure what these numbers will turn out to be. Dang. Right? Dang. We can't get there, I don't think. 
We do know and have talked a lot about Daniel 77, that final seven year period of his prophecy, as well as the second half of that, the three and a half years, the 42 30 day months, the 1260 days. But what would 1290 and 1335 days be? First of all, based on verse 11, we know for sure that, that these 1290 days will begin at the same time as the 1260. 1260 days, that's three and a half years. In, th in 30 month days, which was the Jewish the way the Jewish calendar was set up. And so that will begin again when the daily sacrifice in the rebuilt Jewish temple is done away with by the little horn, the Antichrist, and the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, as predicted by Daniel. Most likely the 1335 days will also begin at that same starting point. The, the midpoint of the tribulation period. I'm going to, just going to call it the starting point. I think the 1260 days start then, the 1290 days start then, and the 1335 days start then. So they all have the same starting point. It's just then the 1290 days are 30 days more, and then the 1335 days is another 45 days more. So I, I think fairly safe in saying that, but still, I, I'll say can't necessarily know for sure, but still, so what's, what are those extra days about? Well, my best stab is after the 1260 days, at, at the end of the three and a half years, Jesus will return. He will destroy the Antichrist and all opposed to him that, you know, that, that are gathered there and as the armies of the world gather against him. Where? In the Valley of Megiddo, the Battle of Armageddon, that stuff, that will all come to a close at the 360, uh, or at the 1260 day mark, three and a half years after the midpoint of the, of the tribulation period. That, that's, that's when that's 1260 will come to an end then. So what about the next 30 days? To get from 1260 to 1290, what about those 30 days? I, the best solution that's been posed that I've read will be Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 25 that he will he will judge the rest the people the human beings who have survived the tribulation period many will die but the ones who have survived Jesus will judge them he talks about it in Matthew 25 the parable of the ten virgins the parable of the talents and and the what judgment the sheep and the goat judgments and, and, and Jesus will judge which one of those, which one of the people, those people, each one individually, who had come to Him in saving faith during the tribulation and who didn't. The ones who did come to Him in true saving faith, they will be welcomed into what? Millennial. The millennial, His millennial kingdom on the earth. They will be part of the mortal human beings who will start the millennial kingdom of Jesus on the earth. And the Jewish ones of those will be the citizens of the nation of Israel that Jesus will reign over on the earth. But out of that group, the ones that do not had not come to saving faith in Jesus, what happens to them? What's the first thing that happens to them? He's doing the judging. He determines that they have not come to Him in saving faith, and then what will He do? What has to happen first? They're mortal human beings. You hear me? Jesus will kill them. Oh, boy, we don't like that, right? Put that one on your coffee cup. I, but I'm serious. People don't want to hear this stuff. But He will kill them because their spirits will be sent where? To Hades to await what? Well, first of all, they will be resurrected. And then, he, who will judge them at the great white throne? Jesus. Jesus will. And where will Jesus send all of them then who had not placed saving faith in Him? To the, to the lake of fire. For how long? Eternity. Eternity. Some believe that during these 30 days, from the 1360 or from the 1260 to the 1290, that 30 days, Jesus will be conducting all that judgment. That's what some believe. Makes some amount of sense to me. Well, then, what about the 45 days then that goes from the 1290th day up to the 1335th day? What about them? Well, the best thing I've seen is: Can you imagine the carnage on the earth after the time of the tribulation? If you haven't ever read in the book of Revelation or if you haven't heard sermons in the book of Revelation, you know, you might want to do that, but the carnage will be unbelievable. Both on the physical earth itself and just think of the number of dead 
bodies. Many people believe that the 45 days that follows Jesus' judgment in which there's going to be a bunch more dead bodies when He's done with His judgment, that there will be 45 days of basically cleanup on the earth. Burying bodies. Making some structures inhabitable. Starting to just clean up the carnage of the tribulation period, Daniel 70 of 7. And at the end of that 45 days then, Jesus will officially assume His throne over the Millennial Kingdom and begin to rule. Makes a lot of sense, but here, here's the bottom line of it again. As I, I don't, will, it, will that be what it will be? I, I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it will be something different. But you know what the bottom line is? The bottom line is this prophecy, even of these two day, periods of days, 1290, 1335, it is specific. And it will be fulfilled specifically. It has specific meaning and it will be fulfilled very specifically. After all those things have happened, then we'll say, so that's what it was. <laughs> Seriously. We will then know what it meant. But regardless of how it all works out, you know what we can know right now? Right now, as I said just a bit ago, that, that both the mortal su surviving believers of hell on earth as well as the immortal, resurrected believers of all ages past, we will get to enter into the earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will experience unimaginable blessedness. Last verse. I know I'm late, as always. Last verse. Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. This has been a long journey, folks. Verse 13, as for you, as for who? This is the angel speaking. As for you, Daniel. Daniel, go on your way till the end. You know how Dot translates that? Dot translates that. Keep on keeping on, Daniel. <laughs> Keep on keeping on till you ain't here anymore. And that's what the angel was telling Daniel. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. The last word the angel had for Daniel was to encourage him to keep on keeping on until when? Yes. Until his earthly life was over. After death, he would enter into a period of rest, his body in the grave, his spirit in glory. But after all the events that we just talked about, all the events that had just been revealed to him, after they're all completed, at the end of the 1,335 days, whatever that's going to mean, Daniel would be resurrected. He would rise. His spirit would be rejoined to his eternally glorified body to receive his inheritance where? Initially. In the millennial kingdom of Jesus. He will be one of those Jews who will enter into the millennial kingdom in a resurrected, immortal, glorified human body. This is probably the clearest evidence in the Bible that believers pre-cross, a lot of times we call them Old Testament believers, and I believe tribulation believers as well, will be resurrected at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. That's why I added this verse. I don't know how I missed it before, but that's why I added it onto my eternal timeline. Post-cross believers, those of us of the church, we will, as we said earlier, will already be resurrected prior to the tribulation period. I close Daniel with this quote from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Biblical evidence. Again, folks, you've got to understand, many churches in this area would believe something different than what I'm teaching you. I have given you why I believe what I believe from the Bible. Here's a, one of those why I believe what I believe from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by teaching, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. The day of the Lord is another term for this, these end times, climatic, uh, traumatic events. Don't be alarmed by people saying that that has already happened. Paul was telling people of his day, we have people today that we need to tell 
the same thing to, especially some that are listening maybe to some of these other teachers that are saying we're already in the, the day of the Lord, that the tribulation period's already beginning and all that. The same reasoning here applies that it can't be. Because it goes on to say, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, this great day of judgment, will not come until the rebellion or the apostasy occurs. And I don't have time to teach about what that is exactly. But the, And the man of lawlessness, which is another reference to the little horn or the Antichrist, has, has been revealed or is revealed. This day of the Lord will not come until the Antichrist is revealed. Has the Antichrist been revealed? No. Do you think we would know if he was? Yes. That even if you don't believe that we're going to be res resurrected prior to that and taken off the earth, even if you don't believe that, have you, you've got to believe that we're going to know if the Antichrist is being revealed. Because that's why Paul was saying, don't believe these people. Don't get worked up by them telling you, oh, it's already happening. It can't be until this man doomed to destruction is revealed. He will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. That's another prediction for what others had already predicted. Some felt that it already got fulfilled when Antiochus was on the earth. But again, this is Paul in, you know, in the 60 AD or, or probably 50 AD for 2 Thessalonians saying that it still hadn't happened yet. It couldn't have been Antiochus. He goes on to say, The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will then overthrow with the breath of His mouth and destroy by the splendor of His coming. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use Satan, will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. This is another example, folks, to, to bring a conclusion to this prophetic book of why I believe what I believe. What the Apostle Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to write in around 50 A.D. or so for, in 2 Thessalonians, it, it backs up why this stuff has not happened yet. It could not have happened yet. This man has not been revealed. And it says that after he is revealed, shortly after that, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be destroyed by who? Jesus. By Jesus. Has that happened yet? No. <laughs> Thank God we know the story, though. We don't understand all the details yet, including the 1290 and the 1335 days. But we know the end. We've talked about that numerous times through the book of Daniel. We know Jesus wins. And because Jesus wins... We win if we have saving faith in Him. And that's, again, I pray if you're in here and you don't have true saving faith in Jesus and you, made him, you haven't made Him the boss, the Lord of your life, you need to do it or you know, you're on the bad side of this. You're on the wrong side, man. For those of us that have, praise Him. Praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love. Proclaim, hail Him. Hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him. Praise Him. Tell, tell others of His excellent greatness. Praise Him. Praise Him, even as we're going to do now, ever, in joyful song. That's the first verse of the closing hymn. Praise Him. Praise Him. Number 12 